week we've been celebrating the 1998 World Series champion New York Yankees are going to be honored um, tomorrow on field in a ceremony at Yankee Stadium. Uh, some call it the greatest team ever. Uh, it's obviously an arguable point, but the fact that they're in the conversation is pretty neat. The Michael K Show on 98.7 ESPN brought to you by GEICO. The real value in car insurance isn't how much you save. It's also the kind of service you get. Good thing GEICO's been perfecting both for over 75 years. And we couldn't talk to all the members of the team without talking to the manager of the team, the guy who put it all together, and uh, that is Joe Torrey. Joe, thanks for joining us on the show. Joe, how you doing? I'm, I'm doing well, Michael. I'm looking forward to this tomorrow. It's uh, yeah. I remember when you and I were in the booth uh, two years ago. I said I'll see you in a couple of years, you know. And uh, God willing, we're both here, and uh, I'm looking forward to tomorrow. Now you've seen a lot of great baseball in your life. You played it. You managed it. Is this the greatest team that you've ever seen? Well, it, it certainly is in in my existence, uh, just the way they went about things. And, you know, I think we all sort of look back and, and wonder, you know, how this came about after losing in, in 97. And uh, But that ball club came, came to spring training so determined that they left stuff on the table in 97. And uh, I really never realized how determined it was until they just, you know, refuse to, uh, you know, not make uh, winning so important on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, you know, you witnessed it, I witnessed it, and, uh, you know, I felt like I, you know, sort of pulled them in, into spring training and all of a sudden jumped on their backs and just enjoyed the ride. Now, to me, you lived it there, when there were two bumps. Amazingly, one was at one and four. We've had mm -hmm. a couple of guys on, and, and Jorge spoke about the meeting that you called. Did you think the team was in trouble at one and four? Because you're not a big meeting guy, from what I remember. No, but I, I I was really disturbed. You know, you come out of spring training and you know you have high expectations. I know we start on the road, but that's no big deal. Although uh, I guess it's more of a big deal when you're closer. I, I, if I'm not mistaken, Mariana was on the DL. Yeah. Uh, starting the season. Uh, but then we got beat up. I mean, we beat up. We didn't play well. And and uh, I remember in Seattle uh, just, you know, really um, upset. And I wasn't upset with any in particular person. It was just the fact that we weren't playing up to our capabilities, even though it was early. And, um, you know, I remember I went out for dinner after the game all by myself, and Don Zimmer says, you know, you want company? I said, no, and I just wanted to be by myself. And, and uh, you know, next day came back, and we had a meeting. David Cohn played a prominent role in that meeting. And, uh, you know, I'm not even sure we won that night, but, uh, you know, we, we seemed to start winning and catch fire and uh, I remember we came home for the welcome home dinner and you know we were sort of you know sort of back on in, on on level ground uh, and and from never looked back from there you know I'm wondering though because you know people forget you know 98 followed 97 when you guys got knocked out against the Indians and you had won the championship in 96 and there have been rumors at that time Joe with a one and four start was Joe Torrey gonna get fired were you ever thought did you ever think at that time that your job was in jeopardy? Well, you know, I mean, you work for George, and, uh, you, you know, you're always on the tightrope. Uh, you know that George is, uh, he reacts, and and he's impulsive, and, and all this stuff. Uh, you know, I, I was hoping that wasn't the case, but, you know, you're on the road, and things get magnified because you're, you're only hearing you know, negative stuff. But, you know, I, I, over the years, I, I, maybe it's because I, I was fired three times in my managing career that that didn't bother me as much as, you know, getting the team on track. And I remember when I showed up, my wife Allie and I showed up at the welcome home dinner, George come over and said, you're my guy, you're my guy. I said, well, you know, thank you, George, and whatever. I think we came home three and four or something on that trip. So, uh, but, uh, you know, I, 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 it wouldn't have surprised me only because of George's history. Uh, I was hoping it wouldn't be the case, and as it turned out, it worked all right, uh, all right for me. You know, I was reading something by Ken Davidoff in the Post today. I didn't remember this, that in that meeting, you know, the, I guess the day before, Joe, that Jamie Moyer had hit Paul O'Neill and then Andy Pettit 
didn't retaliate, and some of his teammates were upset. Do you recall that part of it? Well, uh, uh, you know, for some reason, uh, Paul O'Neill got hit every time we played Seattle. Yeah, he and Lou got along uh, so yeah, well, it's strange. He, he, yeah, <laughs> he and Lou. And, and I know part of that meeting was that, uh, you know, we, we can't let this happen. We, we've got to retaliate. I'm not a retaliate guy, but, but uh, a retaliation guy. But when, you know, the same guy keeps getting hit by the, by the same team, uh, you know, this obviously is intentional, and, and, you know, you've got to recognize it and do something about it. And I, I did make a statement, and it, and it was a little touchy making a statement uh, about, you know, you know, maybe hitting somebody on in their lineup when, uh, you know, your clubhouse contains a couple of the main guys who came over in the trade, you know, right. Nelson and, uh, and Tino. That's right. Now, the other the other bump was in September. I mean, we all celebrate the fact that you won 114 regular season games. But at some point, Joe, I think like like August 10th, you were on pace to win 122, and you could have easily done that, and you ran into a rut. Now, the way Posada remembers it, that everybody wasn't playing every day because you were trying to keep everybody healthy. Did that rut upset you in September? No, just, you know what, Michael, I, it was in, I guess it was early September. We were in uh, Tampa. And there was one game that really concerned me. I wasn't concerned about records. Obviously, you're concerned about, you know, you're you're in postseason, but you want to make sure that, you know, uh, the the second season is something memorable. Uh, but there was one game in Tampa we played awfully, uh, 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 awful baseball, and I had a meeting after the game, and and really the crux of my meeting was. You know, guys, you spent the whole summer making guy making teams afraid to play you, and and then you go out and play this kind of baseball. You know, you, you it's it's just it's not acceptable. And I started laughing, and I had a turnaround because, and, and I know you'll you'll understand this. I look in the corner, and there's my favorite, Bernie shaking his head up and down as I'm talking and I said I, I got I can't look at him cuz I'll laugh and I and I turned around and finished the meeting it was a short meeting but I just wanted to let them know even though you know we're in you know we we're going to win we win the division I think we've already clinched by this time and but it you know it doesn't it it, it doesn't carry over you know you're going to have to play in postseason and you're certainly going to have to go in there uh, not on your heels but on on the balls of your feet so uh, yeah, as I say it was a short meeting but I, I need any time I felt I needed to say something even if it was to one individual Michael I felt that everybody may get something out of what I'm saying because I, I felt, you know, very close uh, to all our teams yeah, and you know as well as I do that it was it was a close-knit group and, and guys who walked in uh, from other teams and played for our club, you know, they caught on in a hurry. It was just something like, uh, you know, we're a family type, uh, I know it's a little corny, but we're a family type club that if we had issues, we dealt with it inside and, and it was uh, our business and nobody else's. Talking to Hall of Famer Joe Torrey, the manager of that 1998 team. We're going to give away tickets a little bit later on in the show to tomorrow's game, thanks to Pepsi and 98.7 ESPN. Um, I think the only misstep or the only sweat, maybe I'll put it that way, in the playoffs, down 2-1 to one, uh, to Cleveland, and then El Duque set to pitch. And I read a story today. George Steinbrenner came in the clubhouse and was like trying to pump up El Duque. And El Duque just looked at him and he said, Manana, no problema. <laughs> Did you have any doubt that he was going to step up in that game? Well, the day of the game, it was interesting. I did. I, I believe it was a Sunday because we were, uh, you know, we were. Um, my, my wife and I was sitting having a, a late breakfast, early lunch, whatever it was, and and the restaurant was a little overwhelmed in the hotel, and Duque was up there helping wait on tables. <laughs> And I said, well, this guy's not ner nervous. You know, I mean, he was in there just, you know, helping the, the waiters and waitresses, you know, move because they were obviously uh, understaffed and they're a little overwhelmed. And and uh, I remember that particular day, George uh, had 
called me or had sent sent a message to me. He wanted to see me up in his uh, up in his suite. Uh, so I told him I'd be up after after breakfast, and um, I went up there. And he says, "What do you think?" You know, and uh, kiddingly, uh, and uh, you know, I, I laughed because it was just George and I, and he was watching the Michigan. I think it was the Michigan Ohio State game, and Michigan was winning, and. And he says, what do you think? I said, well, I think Ohio State will come back and win this game. But that's not what he was talking about. <laughs> and I said, I said, the only thing I could tell you, George, I said, Duque is down there helping wait on tables. So, I, you know, even though he hasn't pitched, and you know, I mean, he kept going to the back of the line. We won the division, and then he, you know, had to take his turn in the rotation. So he hadn't pitched for a while, and that was my only concern. But as far as his approach, he uh, he was loose as a goose and, you know, obviously went out there and dominated the game. Now, we saw it in 2001, Joe, when the Mariners mm -hmm. won 116. They didn't win the World Series. It's like it never happened. And I'm sure the Red Sox are going to feel the same pressure this year where they're on pace to 115 wins. Did you feel you had to win the World Series to validate the season? Yes, and I, and I think, you know, obviously a big part of that, you were the Yankees and uh, but 114 games would have totally been ignored uh, if we didn't do what we were expected to do. And, and that's huge, huge uh, pressure for anybody. And we felt it every step of the way. Even during the Texas series, uh, uh, I remember having one meeting um, down in the runway during the game. I said, guys, we're up two games to none. I said, they're not up two games to none. But these guys were, were tight, but they were unique in the fact that they played well. They, they, you know, they, even though they were, they were tight, they, they still played well. Didn't give anything away, fought for every at-bat. And, uh, you know, we had to squeeze out a run here or there. But the expectation was in all our minds and, and uh, the pressure that was dealt with. But, you know, it, it, wasn't a, it was a little bit of a bumpy ride because of the pressure we had on us, ourselves. Now, Paul O'Neill, who I'm going to have on a little bit later on, has told me a hundred times, yo, that <laughs> that team was shocked when it lost. They, they came into yeah. every game expecting to win. As the manager, did you feel the same way? Yeah, it, it really was. They they never really cared about the standings. They just wanted to go out there. They they got to go to the ballpark every day. You know, like some some people have to go to the office. They got to go to the office every day, and it was really cool. But we had that one meeting also, uh, Michael, and uh, after that terrible game two against Cleveland where, you know, the ball was laying there and we threw it away and we just beat ourselves in game two, uh, I remember having a meeting uh, and said to the guys that you're not having any fun. And Paul O'Neill respectfully waited, and you can ask him about this, he respectfully waited for the meeting to be over. And then he, you know, we happen to walk into each other, either in the lunchroom or in my office, whatever. And he, and he says, Skip, it's not fun unless we win, Skip. And then you can hear Paul O'Neill, your partner, say that because he, he was priceless. I mean, we all loved him for, for the right reasons. And, uh, uh, but uh, there, there were a lot of things that come to mind when we think about that 98 season. Strangely, when we had on Jorge earlier in the week, he said, I said, does it feel like 20 years? And he said, not really. It feels like 10. Now, I don't know how he delineates that. <laughs> does it feel like 20 years ago? No, but you get to my age, you know, it's like standing on the platform of a subway station and watching those cars go by, man. It's uh, it's quick. It's quick. And, uh, you know, it, it's great to look back on and, and realize you still have a closeness with the players that you know, uh, played on those teams, but uh, uh, it certainly doesn't seem like 20 years. Because I, you know, when I when I get the Yankee job, uh, you know, after the the season in '95, and uh, and it was always brand new to me, uh, and you know, all of a sudden it was 12 years, you know, there and gone, and uh, managed a couple, you know, a few years in L.A. and. And here I am now, you know, 20 years later. That's that's ridiculous. And 96, 22 years. I mean, it's amazing. It's, it really is amazing to me, and and it's just great to look back and and look forward to what we're going to do tomorrow. 
Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you because you mentioned earlier about you're not a retaliation guy. What happened in Miami, you know, Keith Hernandez said, that's the way we did it, and I have no problem with doing it. What's your take, Joe? I mean, does the person that's hot deserve to get hit just to stop him? Well, you know what? It, it used to take care of itself, well, you know, as Keith said. Uh, but you, you have to understand, uh, it's, it's more than that anymore. Uh, the thing that concerns me is that every time somebody gets hit, there seems to be a retaliation. Now, uh, you know, you have so many guys throwing 100 miles an hour, and now when they try to, to be precise with their placement of pitches, if they're going to pitch inside, they're going to hit somebody. Uh, that appeared to me the other day like it was intentional. Uh, and, you know, with social media and, you know, I was listening to the announcers when I was watching a replay because I wasn't watching it live, and they were talking about it before the pitch was thrown. So, uh, you know, it gets so much uh, air time, uh, and, you know, obviously players aren't oblivious to this because they hear everything and, and, and they contribute probably on their own. But it, it's, it's concerning because how hard we throw anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the only saving grace in that one the other day is the fact if, uh, you know, it looked, as I said, looked in, intentional to me that if it was intentional, at least it was to the middle of the body and not to the head area because, uh, you know, that ends somebody, somebody's career. As it turned out, you know, this ball hit him in the elbow, which is frightening, and I was happy he was in the lineup last night. Now, your third base coach from 98, Willie Randolph, was on yesterday. He said he understands. He actually understands what Keith was saying. He said, but the way it should be done, he said, you move somebody off the plate and you don't throw right. it to their head. He said, you don't try to hit them. Would you be in agreement with that? Yeah. I mean, there there are times, uh, you know, as, as we were going back to talking about Paul O'Neill, you know, mm -hmm. he, he, you know, they didn't make him move his feet. They hit him. They hit him. So, you know, if, if, if you're going to if you're going to, you know, make a point and retaliate, you know, it, you know, and I've seen, you know, again, the, the, the suspensions are a little bit more excessive when in the, it's in the head area because I don't think players, uh, because of the style of hitting anymore, are able to get out of the way as easily as, as well, I, I might like my time mm -hmm. because it's a different style of hitting. Uh, but, you know, if they're going to in, uh, insist on retaliating with hitting somebody, you know, it's probably the rear end or somewhere in that area is the safest, but not, uh, they don't have that kind of control anymore, and that, that's frightening to me. Now, final thing, because of the 12 years I spent around you when you were the manager, I feel like I know Bob Gibson because <laughs> you would always tell Bob Gibson stories. Did Gibson hit people on purpose? Uh, at times, he, you know, made a point. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Uh, you know, everybody used to say, I remember uh, Willie Stardrill, may his soul rest in peace. Willie used to say, well, you keep pitching inside. He's, I don't pitch inside. And he didn't pitch inside. He stayed away, away, away. If he pitched, if he threw the ball into somebody, it was for a reason. And and that reason, uh, you know, was the fact that they were going out there hitting pitches they shouldn't hit, uh, you know, because they were too comfortable. Uh, let me. Do you have a minute for sure. for for a quick story? Sure. Bill White. Bill White was Bob Gibson's roommate. Okay. And and Bill White, uh, he said Bob Gibson said to him. Hey, Bill, if you ever get traded and you go out there and pull that pitch outside or the outside corner, he said, I'm going to hit you. He just told him right there. Then he does get, he, he, he does get traded to Philadelphia. Uh, we go into Philadelphia, and, you know, uh, Bill White gets a hit off him the first time because he, you know, he threw a pitch down the middle. He should hit it. Uh, next time up, Bill White. You know, he, he pulled a ball that was a ball outside, and he pulled it foul down the first baseline. He was a left-hand hitter. Next pitch, he hit him in the ribs. <laughs> Bill White looked at him. He said, you're crazy as he's going to first base. He said, I told you. Don't and they were really close, outside. right? They were, very, they were, yeah, to this day, they're still very close. But, uh, you know, it, it was just, a, you know, a, a, a different time. 
you know, again, I'm not saying, you know, which is better, uh, but, you know, that was more, you, you pretty much took care of those things on your own. You know, it really wasn't orchestrated in those days. You you, you had a, a sense for what needed to happen, and, and, you know, you pretty much took care of it. My first week in the big leagues, Michael, uh, I got knocked down in every city, and, and and when I say knock down, they threw up my head in every single city just to see how the rookie would handle, you know, getting knocked down. I mean, that that was just the the style of play in those days. And it's different now. It has to be, right? Because, yeah, as you it, said, people it, don't it have to come to in. Be. It certainly is. And I think we're taking the things a lot more uh, personal than, than, you know, this is a game we're playing. You know, it seems to be a lot more personal. And, Joe, great stuff. You know, yeah, thank, sometimes thank, it's volatile. Thank you so much. I can't uh, wait to see you tomorrow in the dugout before the ceremony. Same here, Michael.